interestingly, uh, the Hispanic population in this country is growing so much. Um, and some statistics show that by 2050, uh, minority population is going to be dominant in this country. Keep in mind that Hispanics are a huge, um, they're, they're diverse in, in, in their own um, cultures, right? They're, they come from over 20 countries in the world. So even among the different countries, you see differences. Um, is it a shock when you when it's when you run into women who are directly affected or impacted by this who don't know that this is an issue as well? And how do you explain that to them or break it down to them? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, as we have discussed, this is a, a problem that is like you call it the silent crisis because again, nobody wants to talk about it or deal with it or you know, even acknowledge that, you know, most of us have um, this um, uh, implicit bias, right? Uh, with everything that we do in our lives. And so um, definitely patients on their own may, may uh, have experience with that, you know, are affected by it, but they don't know about it. So it is it, just also a part of educating not only patients, but everybody in the healthcare community. And is it important that Hispanic patients go to Hispanic doctors, black patients go to black doctors, white patients go to white doctors, or can it be any of any or as long as you trust that doctor and that doctor is good for you? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be like that. You know, everybody should understand all the patients, right? We're here not to treat only our own, right? I'm not here only to treat Hispanic patients, I'm here to treat everybody um, the same way, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that you bring a very good point in terms of the trust, right? When, when a patient goes to a doctor who doesn't understand their culture, who doesn't understand why she's not following the treatment, why she's not coming to see me, I told her to come back, she's not coming back. Um, why she's not doing what you tell her um, or what you recommend it to do in terms of treatment. Um, you know, people have to understand that there are barriers that, you, that, that these patients need to trust us. Are uh, American, minority American women more at risk than women around the country? Yeah, definitely. It's so amazing to know that we are in a first world country, we have all the resources available to us and, and to people, theoretically, right? But, you know, it's not the case. Um, the, the, for example, the, the uh, maternal mortality rate in this country is about 17 per 100,000 births. If you compare that to other developed countries, uh, Norway, New Zealand, um, Netherlands, they have three in 100,000. So how can we be, you know, a fully developed country and have such a discrepancy with those other countries? So I think definitely our women are more risk um, in terms of their health and more so minority women uh, when they have even less access to healthcare. We need to be worried about women and kids, but also what role does a father play in making sure that the mother is well taken care of as well. Um, I think that in terms of pregnancy and labor and delivery, um, the father needs to be involved, right? He, although it's not his own health per se, uh, but it's his partner and um, the child, right? So I think that they can be advocates for women's um, health and children's health. Um, you know, the, the, the health of the baby is going to be directly um, related to the maternal health, right? You, that's why we say, you know, pre, even pre-pregnancy um, visits, right? To make sure that the woman before going into pregnancy are healthy, right? Leading a healthy lifestyle. A lot of the times, let's say I have a patient who is smoking and we're like, okay, we highly recommend that you stop smoking. These are all the bad things about smoking. If you want to get pregnant in the future, you need to stop. But you have their partners there 
or or they say, um, well, my husband also smokes. It's so hard for me. Okay, so he also has a role into that, right? They're going to stop smoking together. If one of them stops smoking, it's gone. Yes, but it's better if both of them do. And then while they have a child, um, you know, the risk for the child decreases as well. So that's one example of how the, the, the paternal health is also important in the in the maternal and the child's health. There's a lot of emphasis politically placed on abortion and whether or not women should have the abortion, but there's not a lot of emphasis placed on helping minority women even get pregnant and conceive or be able to carry a child to full term without the woman being in danger or the child being in danger, which I think is another big issue with this. Yeah, so here's where um, the, the pre-pregnancy visits and, and prevention comes from, right? Identifying, you know, in an ideal world, we want everybody who's wanting to get pregnant come for a visit first, right? Identifying the risk factors, identifying what medications she's taking, what, um, you know, uh, habits that she's doing, smoking, drinking, how much exercise she's doing, um, uh, so that they go into pregnancy as healthy as they can be. So those risk factors can at some point be altered before the pregnancy. So that's the ideal situation, right? Um, and then the, in terms of the law and, you know, the, the, um, from the government, I think that they, they need to put emphasis in reaching out and so that, um, minority women have access at least because a lot of them, they don't have access. They, they're uninsured. They're, um, um, undocumented people who, are afraid even to show up to the doctor. Oh, what's going to happen to me? I'm going I'm to get deported. I'm going to get, you know, a, a huge bill for my the medical services. Right? This is one of the few countries that don't give um, healthcare to everybody. Right? Even even with the Affordable Care Act, you still have a lot of patients, a lot of people who don't have access to um, healthcare, which is really sad. That should be a right that you have when you're born.